So Kevin and I were on stage about a year and a half ago together, right as a kind of, there was some hoo-ha <laughs> going on with iOS and Flash. And it's, it's just a different story now, I think. And you guys are really fully invested in Android. And well, we're working across operating systems, uh, but we've done a lot of great work on Android. Um, and our intentions, like we did with our software across Mac and Windows, is to have our software run across operating systems here as well. Um, but one of the things we did recently with Android was we've come out with a bunch of apps that are Android first. Um, and a lot of people right now are doing iOS first with their application development. And um, in, these, in this case, we didn't. We came out Android first. Uh, and one of the reasons was we're able to work with uh, the community around Android really well. So for example, Samsung, um, we worked in good partnership with them and we were able to use uh, their tablets as a development environment for us and also we could push the edges of what was going to happen with hardware too um, and start prototyping things with them. So the, I don't know if you guys read the announcements that happened at Max, but Adobe released a number of touch apps. So I mean, something I think is gonna be huge coming up, especially in the, for creative workers, but I think for all of us, are the idea of basically multi-screen use. And that's what you guys, I think, are really pioneering right now. Could you? Yeah, multi-screen is huge. I, I think you need to really start thinking about how to design your applications that work across multiple form factors uh, and multiple operating systems. And people are starting to do that now in their app development. And that's what we're doing, of course, with, with our apps, too. So we're working on something called Creative Cloud, uh, which is obviously accessible from whatever device you're using. And then a whole new set of touch applications for creativity. Thanks for tuning that in, all right. Um, so um, I have a cloud background because these all work with the cloud. Um, so here's uh, a couple of examples of applications. This is, um, well maybe I will show you Proto first. We, we've done an application called Collage, uh, which is, what's going on here? I just had some banana bread right before this, so my finger may be a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so this is one called Collage, and what these apps do is enable you to be creative wherever you are. And so we really thought about what, what applications can we make to help people do that. Not just taking our current Creative Suite products and trying to make miniature versions of them. Um, in, in the case of Photoshop, we did come up with a new Photoshop Touch application, but a lot of these are new. And this is one called Collage, and I can create um, uh, designs here. Oh man. My fingers have just stopped working. I, don't know. I didn't eat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't know. Maybe it's the light. Okay, so here's um, collage. And what you can do here is basically do um, ideation. So you can put together um, a collage of different ideas that you might want to use. Maybe we should talk about something else. My fingers hurt. <laughs> okay. We can also try and put that down. Yeah. But the thing with multi-screen is the idea that your computer, I mean, you are working on all these different screens at once. They are all being touched by you. You want to be able to interact across these devices and not have an isolated experience. Like, I've always wondered, like, why does my phone not tell my laptop where I am so that I get Seattle local searches? Well, I'm going to go try this other one. This is a prototype that we were working on um, with, with Samsung. And I think this should work. So this is a, um, a device that actually has a, a touch screen on it, but it also has a pen sensitive screen on it. And this isn't released yet, but it's something that we've been working on with Samsung. Wow. <laughs> huh. Well, you can watch me showing this online uh, just a few days ago. <laughs> It's weird, when I'm holding it here, it works fine, and then when I put it over here, it doesn't work anymore, and I'm not sure what's going on with that. It does work, we, <laughs> okay. we saw it. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you for the feedback, this is good. Okay, there we so go. here we go. So this is the pen. Here I'm, I'm turning this drawing into a pencil, and um, pencil sketch, and I can actually use this for intensity. You see I get a little, a little bit, when I press harder, I get a wider line. And this is something you can't do very easily um, with tablets today, but with a pressure sensitive pen you can do that. Um, and I can also turn the pen upside down, I can erase, <laughs> as you'd expect from a pen. I can undo that. My finger doesn't work still, okay. Um, and uh, so I can pencil this in, oh there we go, I can paint it back in again. Um, something else you can do is, I'm gonna get a different brush here, and 
I'm painting an effect right now, and I jumped right into something that you can't even do in Photoshop today. Uh, that kind of kind of dragging your, your pen around and applying an effect where you touch is something that is unique to the tablet. Um, I'm going to switch to um, just actually painting with paint, so you can see an example of color painting. So here's color painting, and again, I can get the thickness. And if I want to, I can extract a color. So if I've got a button on the side of my pen, I can pull up this nice brown color here, and now I can start painting in brown. Or I can press the button on the side here and get this nice blue right there, and I can start painting in blue. Um, and so you can see, actually, you get a hover when the pen is over something, so you can see where you're going to draw. And also, when I have the button down, you can see the little eyedropper show up. So that kind of proximity sensing is something that's possible uh, with an active pen like this. And we're going to see this coming to, to tablets. Um, and we're building our applications so that they're ready uh, for this world when you actually have active pens. Certainly, all the apps work with your finger and touch, but you can go even further when you've got a stylus that's, that's this sensitive. And I think for creative work, uh, people are going to want that more and more. And, and with Android, we're able to imagine something like that, work in the ecosystem with the partners, and uh, have that work across you know, Google and Samsung and ourselves and Wacom and, and bring that out in a way that enables us to play even ahead of those devices being available, which isn't true of, of other ecosystems. So that's been really, really powerful for us and, and a great thing about Android. Cool. Yeah. Now, in addition to releasing the Touch APIs, you also purchased PhoneGap, or really Natobi last week, the creators right. of PhoneGap. What's the story there? Yeah, well, we're doing a lot of work around HTML5 uh, as well as with, uh, with Flash and other stuff. And with HTML5, we've been building things ourselves. So we've got Edge, and we've got uh, contributions to jQuery that we've been making now over the past year. And we really wanted to have a great way to bring HTML construction of applications uh, to, to different devices. And we looked around and said, well, there's a really great one already uh, that does that, which is PhoneGap. And so we've, we've brought that team into Adobe. It's very exciting. It's a great team. Um, and we're actually contributing the PhoneGap code to Apache Foundation. It's going to be managed. The open source project will be managed through Apache, which is a really mature organization for handling these projects. And is Adobe still going to support PhoneGap? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's why we're, we're excited about it, yes. <laughs> um, it accelerates what we can do now, and so it's really great. And it's not only the technology, which of course we're still working on, um, but it's the team members, you know, some really, really bright guys uh, who are coming in. And actually, they're based in Vancouver right now, and uh, the majority of them, almost all of them, are moving to San Francisco now. So you'll see phone gap engineers walking the streets of San Francisco. Um, yeah, so it's great. And then also Typekit uh, was another, we did two acquisitions mm -hmm. last week. Uh, Phone Gap, and then also Typekit. And that's led by Jeffrey Veen and Brian Mason and the team. And they're based here in San Francisco. And uh, so their, their whole team is joining as well. And they're going to be working not only on the font work, which they've done with Typekit, um, but they're going to do more kit-like things to enable people to easily build sites. And fonts was what they were starting with, but there's going to be more. So yeah, they've really... always had a much bigger vision exactly. than just fonts. Yeah, it's kind of like the kit part was really more interesting even than the font part. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, so they're going to be able to do even more of that stuff, and really uh, they're joining the creative cloud effort and, and really going to help shape that and lead that, which is true. So, so how do you hope to change kind of the Android development story with these purchases and the cloud initiatives? Well, you know, building applications across these devices, you need to choose uh, how you're going to do that productively. And what we're seeing is that you can certainly build native applications. And you want to get the most power. Building a native app is the way to do that. Uh, if you want to build an app that runs cross OS, uh, it has the productivity of kind of more abstract languages like like JavaScript or ActionScript or Flex or whatever framework jQuery you want to use. Uh, that's really where you're getting the most productivity today. And by building applications that way, they can run, if you want them to, across multiple operating systems. And, and I think that's really important to do uh, now. And if you look at computing, you know, we keep getting these extra levels of abstraction to make us more productive. And the, the web layer is really the current level of abstraction uh, that really is super productive and gets you a you know, great reach. So it uh, doesn't mean you can't still go down to the metal as much as you want to. Uh, and you can do that with both PhoneGap. Uh, there's extension model there. Um, and also with Air, uh, there's native extension models. So you can get at whatever level of native coding uh, you want to get to. And just as a side note, Joe Bowser of Natobi is going to be talking about PhoneGap later today and how to write custom extensions that drop into native code. So That's cool. how is the cloud service around PhoneGap going to work? PhoneGap build? Yeah, PhoneGap build is a way of actually packaging your application um, and then deploying it to the stores. And right now, if you want to package your app for all the different uh, operating systems, 
you have to download and install the development environments and the SDKs and the signing utilities for all the OSs, and it can take you days to install these things. I mean, it's the, you have to get um, Xcode, you have to get the development environment from uh, RIM, and also for Android, and in some cases, they only run on Mac or they only run on Windows, and so you have to have actually VMs for all these different uh, development environments, and so you end up with all these virtual machines and all this code on your computer just to, just to package your application uh, for these stores. So build makes it so you don't have to do that, and you can develop in your IDE, and then send your code up actually to Git, GitHub if you want to, and you can actually build directly from GitHub uh, to PhoneGap build in the cloud, and it just gives you the native wrappers for all the different versions of your app, and it will show you if you have any errors or anything like that, wrapping your app in each of the different SDKs. And it's so, free for open source projects, right? Right, exactly, which is really cool, yeah. Now, what about the digital publishing suite? Oh yeah, so digital publishing suite, uh, that, that is basically a way to enable people to publish magazines or catalogs or whatever you want to tablets. Um, and so that, right now we've been working with some of the top publishers, there's about a thousand titles now, like Wired Magazine and, and Martha Stewart and things like that. And then last week um, we announced that we're going to, doing, going to enable single edition. So basically as an individual, you can publish a magazine to the App Store. Um, and it's, it's priced on a per issue basis. You don't have to have some sort of larger uh, agreement to do it. Um, and it's, it enables you to make a comic book or a neighborhood magazine. There's a hang gliding safety manual that somebody made. Um, and then what's really exciting to me is there's a bunch of art books that are being made now, people describing what their process was. Uh, eBoy has one up there right now. It's in the App, Apple App Store. I think it's up now. It's 99 cents. And it shows their, the great work that they've been doing uh, with, with pixelated images. And then Eric Natsky is coming out with a book that describes his process, which is really deep and kind of take, dis, it, it dissembles the work that he's done and deconstructs it and really shows you what were all the ingredients that made this work happen. Uh, and it's in a very thoughtful magazine format. And you can immerse yourself in it and really experience it. Now, some of the Adobe tools have, been, have had performance issues or claims of performance issues. What have you guys found? What have you been working on in that front? Like our Creative Suite tools and things like that you're talking about? Um, Flash and Flex and Oh, Air Flash on... runtime. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, we've been working on performance in Flash, obviously, for a while now. And we've gotten to, to a point where it's great. Uh, the performance is running really well. And I don't think anybody believes me when I say that. Uh, so, um, so I brought, actually, a demo. So let me show you. Me if you need me to do it, let me know. OK, I might. I might. <laughs> I'll just start it going over here, okay, let's see. So here I've got a browser, and this is, these are some performance tests done by uh, someone on the web that we found. Uh, I didn't have anything to do with these, um, and you can make your own tests. So here are some bouncing balls, which is one way of testing performance. Of course, you can test performance lots of different ways. <laughs> I think I need you to press that. <laughs> no. Actually, maybe off of. I'll do it over here. Okay, uh, look, I don't know, okay. <laughs> that worked, okay. So this is SVG, and SVG is bouncing a thousand balls around here, and there are no drop shadows on these balls, they're supposed to be, but SVG doesn't, uh, doesn't do that. And it's running about eight frames per second, all right? So, so let's go back to the top here. I'm gonna show you HTML. So this is HTML uh, running, that same animation of bouncing balls, 1,000. Now there are drop shadows here, and this is run by JavaScript. And you can see it's running about two and a half frames per second. So let's look at another example. So this is uh, Flash running, 1,000 balls, same thing. So you can see the performance is amazing with Flash here. We're running about 12, 13 frames per second which is several times faster uh, than what we've seen with HTML or SVG. Now, I really like HTML, so don't be confused. Like, I think performance is gonna keep improving on HTML rendering technologies, mm -hmm. and stuff will improve on Flash, but where we are right now is the Flash team has done a great job getting performance to really rock um, on mobile devices, and Android in particular. And a lot of this was due to our collaboration with the Android team itself. So our engineering team and Android team have been working together for a few years now, and it's a great relationship. Um, this is uh, Canvas. Same thing, 1,000 balls with the drop okay. shadows, about four frames per second. So, um, so Flash is doing uh, really well in terms of performance. Now, the, the thing that is still needing to be done is that it's not just raw performance on mobile. You have to design for the touch screen. And a lot of content on the web today, of course, was built prior to touch interfaces really being prevalent. Um, and you really need to rethink the th stuff that you've built for touch. So it doesn't kind of absolve you of that. Uh, if you've made content, it's up on the web today, and you haven't thought about touch, 
you got to go back and look at it again and really think, uh, how, does, how does the touch interface change what I'm building? And we did that for our applications. You know, the apps I'm showing you right now, um, like I was saying before, are not just, let's take our mouse-based interfaces and try to squeeze them on here. It's really a rethink um, in how you're building your applications. And those rethinks don't happen very often. You know, the, there was the time of keyboards and displays, and mm -hmm. then we went to the mouse. And, and that really enabled a whole generation of creative stuff to be done. And these, these changes happen maybe every couple of decades. And this change with touch now is as big as the mouse was, I think. What do you think will come after these tablet-sized devices? Well, there's going to be a variety of form factors. So of course, there's already phones and tablets, and, there, and people are playing with different sizes of tablets. And then you've got your personal computer screen. You have your television screen. And the revolution of IPTV is we're just at the beginning of that. So that's going to be. You know, if you're making content right now, you're probably not thinking about the television, just like you weren't thinking about phones, you know, several mm -hmm. years ago. Um, that's going to be a huge opportunity. Yeah, I mean, my tablet is my, I don't have a TV, but when I have a computer hooked up to a projector, my tablet and my phone using Magic Mouse are the way I control yeah. it. So, yeah. you know, given still... your close collaboration with the Android team, can you give us any insight into what's coming from Ice Cream Sandwich in a couple weeks? I don't want to get in trouble with Andy, so no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, but they're doing a great job. You know, the Android team is really a rocking team, and it's been a pleasure working with them. And we've done a lot together. We're going to do a lot more. Um, and one of the reasons we were able to bring our apps out on Android first here was we've got this great relationship, and we're able to to keep innovating. So it's a it's a good it's a good thing. Android really is changing the world, and it's a it's a fun time to be playing with it. Excellent. Well, yep. thank you very much, yep. Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Thanks, Brady. We can get this. Up. Uh, and now we're going to close the conference, Marco, or the keynotes, <laughs> the keynotes, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're just starting, so. Yeah, we, we are just starting. So we have a full day of sessions. Uh, sessions are going to go till 5.40. Again, the ex-commerce bus is out there starting at 10 o'clock, or so it's already out there. Uh, lunch, sponsored by HTC Pro. Sponsor gallery is open throughout the day. Uh, a live filming of All About Android from Twit TV starting at 5, right out there. And then the startup showcase at 7 o'clock. And make sure you download the app and make sure you rate the sessions and enjoy the show. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Right.